Joshua Smith here, and welcome to the GSD Mode Podcast. Now get shit done and smash that subscribe button now. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode interview. Every single week, we interview top real estate agents, top entrepreneurs, and strip top badasses that are dominating their space. These are people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves and their families. And today, you guys, got another rock star guest on the show. This is a guest that's a good friend of mine. We're actually in the same market. Um, and this dude's just on freaking fire, right? So our guest today, you guys, um, uh, got into the real estate business at the age of 25. He's only been in the business for about five years and went from, like we all start, you know, right? Uh, 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 no transactions, uh, doing nothing, um, to... $65 million in gross volume sales in five years. Um, so the dude just slain. He's got a team now of 17 agents based in Chandler, Arizona. And in addition to that, you guys, he's flipping and wholesaling 50 plus homes a year, also has a family, and just continues to kick ass. So really excited to have Templeton walk on the show. Show my friend. Thank you, Josh, man. It's an honor to be here. I've listened to you for the last four or five years. So uh, to now be on the podcast means a lot to me. Yeah, no, it's awesome, man. I'm, I'm stoked. We, 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 uh, before we hit the record button, we've been jamming for like an hour. And yeah, I'm like, we've been hit the like we're, we're going through, you know, so much great content, man. And yeah, it's so awesome, man. I, I love uh, the, um, interviewing and just, just rolling with people dude, that are just, just on fire, man, that are, that are kicking ass, that think different. And, you know, off air, we had a lot of conversation, uh, a deep conversation about that next level and that drive. And, you know, how, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you go out there? And a lot of people are thinking about, Hundred grand, two hundred grand, five hundred grand. We're like, how do you create billion dollar freaking companies and right. exciting shit, dude? Um, but before we get into what we're do, you're doing now, because I, I really want to. The, the growth is insane, as I told you off air. Like where you're at in your business is vastly ahead of where I was at at that time in my business, and and you know you, you're going to skyrocket past me very quickly. Um, so I'm really intrigued on, on how you built this. But before that, dude, how, how'd this happen, man? Like how, how did you get into real estate in the first place? What led you at the age of 25 to jump into this space? So had a son at 18. I had a basketball scholarship uh, to a small junior college up in Prescott, Arizona, Yavapai. Um, my girlfriend and I at the time, we got pregnant at 18. So that kind of changed my life plan, right? Like I always thought I was going to go to college four years, get it paid for by basketball. And then, you know, I don't know, do whatever. Um, well, my life kind of got spun on its head at 18. So I moved down here, tried to make it work with her. We actually have an amazing relationship now, but we share our son half and half. And I had to start working, you know, like without a degree. So really the only way to make money was, in my opinion at that time, was sales. So I started selling different things, whatever. It was cars, hated that. Um, I just went, you know, all the sales jobs you think someone could have, I would have. And, I, you know, I've always been a high D at heart. So if it didn't vibe with me well, I just, I wouldn't do it. I'd be like, no, nope, not doing this. Which at the time seemed like a a curse, but it really was a blessing because it led me to where I am today. Um, my best sales jobs that kind of where I learned a lot was uh, Nordstrom. I sold women's shoes at Nordstrom, which was a fun time um, right there in Old Town Scottsdale. But Nordstrom taught me what culture meant and what it what service meant. Like they really taught me how you could create a culture. Not it's one thing to give great service as just a solo agent. But how do you create a culture of service throughout 5,000, 10,000 people? That's a whole different story, right? And um, I was all in on it. Like there was nothing I wouldn't do for a customer. So I learned a lot of that there. Um, but um, then I moved on to mortgages. That's how I got into the real estate business. I was at Quicken Loans. That's kind of like a freaking, bro, you're on a dialer for 12 hours. And with the promise of riches, a lot of young kids, we've never made any money. You know, hey, you're going to make six figures, which was true. but you have zero life. So I realized I wanted to be in the industry, but I didn't want to be on that end. Um, so I got licensed. I then pivoted to selling a multi-level marketing pill. I called my aunt Cindy in Prescott, who's an amazing realtor. Um, and I was like, Hey, Aunt Cindy, I got this pill. And she's like, damn it, temp. I want the pill. And I'm like, all right. And she goes, I, I'll make a deal with you. I'll buy your stupid pill, which is actually kind of, it was kind of cool, but I'll buy this if you let me pay for real estate school and you pay me back on your first deal. I was like, cool, as long as you buy the pill, I need this 200 bucks. So I just took to it though, like a moth to a flame, man. Like I came out the gates hot. Like I just, I teach on this now and I, I did three things really well. I'm a realtor, I'm excited about it and I wanna help you. 
I just made sure anybody in my world knew that. I'm a realtor, I'm excited about it, and I want to help you. And it was genuine and it was authentic, and that's how I shared it. And um, friends and family, and just so thankful they used me early. And that's the first time I ever made real money. And like, I was like, okay. Like, I think the first, like my second month, I made like 17 grand. And I, mind you, I've never made more than like 50 grand at this point. Um, and I was like, all right, this is what I'm doing. Like, I'm all in. <clears throat> so that's kind of the story. That's kind of like the origin story, I guess. Yeah. So, no, I love it, dude. So, all right, man. So you get licensed, you know, right? You got those three things you talked about. Um, you know, but, but dude, like two months in to, to put 17 G's in escrow, I mean, your, your first, I mean, we all know the stats, right? 90% of realtors drop out in the first three years. Your average first year realtor makes less than $10,000. Like, like, dude, that's almost unheard of. Like, I mean, you hear about the agents that may be in it for six or seven months because it takes time to build that pipe. But, you know, walk us through, um, you know, what those first few months look like. Like, how do you put 17 grand escrow 60, 90 days in the business? You know, kind of. Dude, again, so I just started raising my hand. I, re I literally remember making a video about my, my realtor key. I was so genuinely excited. I was like, you guys, I have a key that will get you into any house. Like, this is unreal. Like, I can get you into homes. Like, let's go. Like, I was making videos like that where I was genuinely just so excited to be doing it. Um, and I think people fed off that energy and they were attracted to it. And they were like, hey, man, he's new, but he, if nothing else, he's grinding and he's excited about it and he's he's genuinely willing to help. Like I have a big heart, but I care, you know, if you're in my world, I care immensely about you and people know that. So what I did was I just, I made content and I was on social media, probably 20% of the people hated me because I was always posting about real estate, but you know, I, I convinced my parents to buy a house that me and my wife, my then girlfriend, my now wife could rent from them. So that was a deal. Um, I had a good friend hit me up that needed to sell and buy. And then I had, um, I sat an open house and found a buyer and, you know, so four deals popped, you know, four deals at the time I was on a terrible split at this, this brokerage. So after they took their pieces, man, I had like 17 grand though. I was just like, Oh my God, like this is, this is the life that I'm going to live. Right. And then I didn't close like a deal for like two months and I was like, Oh shit. Like I'm not going to make 17 every month. Um, so I had to learn the hard way on that, right? The roller coaster. But, um, really, man, I just got super vocal about what I was doing. If you were in my world or if you bagged my groceries or if you cut my hair or if you taught me, uh, if you were my teacher in third grade, you were going to know that I was in real estate and I was really excited about it and I would love to help you. Yeah. Now I love that dude. I love it, man. So, all right. So, and I, and I think that's, that's really important for listeners to, to hear. Cause I mean, I meet so many real estate agents. And, and even a lot that join my team that like right out of the gate, they're like, they want to master the expire script or the physical script and go, you know, go after that new business. But I'm like, look, dude, the freaking golds and people you already know, right? Nine percent of, of, of buyers and sellers right now are going with it. Pick, pick a real estate agent. That's a friend, family member, relative neighbor, you know, or real that used in the past. Like expires is like one and a half percent of the business out there, right? I mean, it's just the scraps. So you hit up your SOI first um, and, and you're, you're very open about this on social media. Did you also, like pick up the phone and reach out to everybody you know or was it really just making sure we're connected on social media and making sure they were aware of that that way so in the beginning i had no idea so it's mostly just like me just taking massive action and in like a, a genuine authentic way but i was doing so many things wrong josh i mean i didn't now i, I finally got some coaching like in my second year when i really kind of blew up and i I re-engaged my database. Um, if you've ever heard of the core, I coached with them for a little bit. So I did a letter from the heart. So I let people into my life. You know, I wrote them a letter and said, hey, here's what I'm up to. Here's what I'm aspiring to do. And here's why I'd love to be in your world. So I write them literally a handwritten letter. Then I also would call them. Then I would also email them. Then I would also send them a video. So I got more tactical in my messaging. But in the beginning, man, it was like me and my phone, just like, hey, I'm out here. I'm showing houses. You know, like I was just kind of, I was really loosey goosey. I didn't know what the heck I was up to, but I was just doing it like constantly. But I did in my second year, I got much more sophisticated about it and finally got some coaching, which is huge. I mean, you and I spoke about coaching for 10 minutes before this is, you know, we don't have to go touch all the hot pots. There's a lot of people that have touched the hot pots that can say, Hey, don't do that. Do yep. this. You know what I mean? Yep. Love it. Do you know, all right. So, so talk about the, the, you know, your first few months, 
killed it with that. Then you had a couple months of, of uh, no business and you had, kind of had to learn the hard way with the ups and downs and roller coaster and lack of, you know, with, with, with that. So like, like what, what then the transition from there, how, how did you get it to the point where you were consistent enough to keep growing? Cause it, year two was the coaching. So I'm guessing though you had consistent so, business for the coaching. So year f- the first year I did like 5 million bucks. Um, and then the second year I did about 12 million solo. And that was the year where I was running out of bandwidth. I had no leverage. I couldn't keep up right to sell 12 million on your own. And I wasn't selling million dollar homes by any means, you know? So I was just, I was just grinding. Right. Um, that's when I realized I needed to get some leverage. So, um, the coaching was huge. And then also I just had to get more serious on like working on myself because in that first year I could have done 10 million in the first year, but I would get papered up. And then me and my wife would be like, I was addicted to the hot wire app, man. I was booking resorts and drinking mojitos, chilling, and I'd run out of money. And then I'm like, oh shit, I got to go make more money. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I had to kind of have a come to Jesus talk with myself and say, hey, Temp, do you really want to do this? Or do you kind of want to half step? Because you could do that. I mean, you could live a good life as a realtor kind of half interested, but that's just not how I want to operate, you know? So I wanted more. So that second year I got serious. I started paying for coaching and um, I started to put some systems around my business. All right. So, um, 5 million first year and in, insane dude. Right. So, um, and then you, you over double that. So at those, those first two years before you got to the point, we started dialing your systems and, and, and whatever. The reason I, I, I really trying to go deeper into this is, you know, right. Like, what the heck was I doing? Well, well, but you, you were like, Hey man, yeah, I'm making 12 million. You know, I'm doing 12 million gross volume a year. I'm kind of half interested. I mean, I know a lot of real estate is working hundred hours a week that that would give anything to be doing 12 million a year in production. You know, that's what, you know, 400 grand a year, 300 grand a year, whatever, right. um, that they, they'd be making as individual agents. And, you know, um, um, and I know, you know, you're grinding your ass off. Right. Um, but it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what were, can you give us an idea of what were you doing to, to make that business was still sphere of influence? You know, so, right? yeah, so let me dive deeper into that. So I started to create the buckets, right? So I had the SOI bucket that I was going to love on through the core coaching tactics, which was going to be a letter from the heart, evidence of success, and then a birthday, like a VIP top 50 birthday program, where if you were super special in my life, uh, you were going to get acknowledged on all the important dates in your life. Because if you run that correctly, that should lead to one referral per person. And if you have a VIP top 50 list, some are going to send none, but some are going to send two or three referrals. But if you really run that list correctly, that should be 50 deals right there. Um, So I got serious about the SOI, more tactical. But then I also got committed to open houses because I just, I didn't want to work the phone so much. I mean, I would try and I had mojo, but like, I was at a brokerage where no one else was really like doing that. So I'd go in and I just had no guidance on it. So I just defaulted to like, you know what? I know I can go put signs out. And once I meet people, I'm charismatic and I'm genuine and I'm caring. If I can get belly to belly, belly with people. I think I can connect with them. So I know, I mean, I have a client to this day that I met, you know, they let me, this is big on limiting beliefs. I didn't think I could sell homes like this yet, but she let me sell her half a million dollar home and I sold them a half a million dollar high rise. And I was brand new, didn't really know what I was doing, but I believed I wasn't qualified to do that, but they, they had all the belief in the world in me. Right. So open houses was huge. And then really what I did, the third piece. So you got your sphere of influence bucket. Then I had my open house, which is kind of like my sweat equity. I had to put in my prospecting. And then, um, I started spending money on my business. Like I had to learn all my money's not mine. Some goes to the government. But also, more importantly, quite frankly, is I started taking 20% and buying, you know, I, so really what I did is I was on, I was like on a secret phone call in the other living room. So my wife wouldn't hear asking Zillow for $5,000 of spend, which I didn't quite have at that time. And I was like, yeah, I'll take 5,000. Cause I went from like 500 a month and I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going all in. I'm going to do 5,000 a month. And I'm going to make a commitment to myself that if that phone rings from Zillow, I'm going to freaking grab it. And um, that turned into like 200 G's in commissions, which, which kind of gave me the capital to start T group. Yeah. So those were the three buckets, SOI open house, and then being diligent, diligent about taking my money and not going and blowing it, reinvesting it in my business. Those were the three main catalysts. 
Yeah, no, I love it, dude. And in, 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 I know that you've been in the boot camp, so you've heard me preach about this, but it's, uh, you know, so many real estate agents try to go out there, they do fucking, try to do a dozen different things or a hundred different things. It's like, man, success is in doing a few things thousands of times. And, you know, it's like hitting that SOI, you know, right? And then two of the leads, sort of, and like today, I look at this, like we hit our SOI hard. Last year, 653 homes sold, but all we do for new business, dude, is open houses, Facebook leads. Like, like, dude, I can't even fathom adding a third thing, even with our production, you know, right? Just going so deep into those and being consistent with them. And, and I love it, dude. So then, all right, man, so you get to the point, 12 million, you know, right? But you decide to fully commit right. um, um, uh, going into your, what, your third year at this point, like into your second yep. year. Um, and, and that's when you're building your system processes, start growing your team. Like, like kind of walk us through what happens then. Like, what was that phase so, um, that, that led to the team? So I call one of my best friends who still works with me today, Brandon Slevin. He's up in Colorado and he had an interest in real estate. So I call him and say, Hey man, I got more buyers and deals than I know how to handle at this point. Move down here and help me. And he's like, we've always talked about it, man. I'm all in. So he moves down. So it started off with just me and him in this little office that was like the size of a closet. Just like, all right, what do we do now? Right? Like we were just kind of essentially, but what I did wrong was I didn't hire an admin first. I brought on buyer's agents first. And then I had other people because the way I share my life on social media, it attracts people. Right. And they say, man, what are you up to? You look like you're loving your life. You're making good money. Can I come do that? And I would always be like, yeah, man, like I'm going to hire you. So I had like five buyer's agents at one point with no admin and I'm not an admin guy. Right. So I'm helping them write contracts and stuff. So it really was kind of put a plateau in my business and really hurt me. So anyway, Brandon comes out, um, I hire a few other people, great people, you know, great agents, but I didn't have that admin piece, but I knew I needed it. So I started to try and find a, a great assistant, uh, transaction manager, you know, my first admin hire and I hired it wrong three different times. I mean, one lady, super sweet. Her name was Linda, but she was old and there's nothing bad with being old, but I didn't test her computer aptitude. Everything else was great. And then we got in there, bro. And she's like, okay, I'm opening the email. And then I'm going to write the email and now I'm typing the email. I was like, fuck, let's go. Like, <laughs> so dude, I gave her four weeks pay and I was just like, <coughs> I'm so sorry. like, I hate letting people go. I just like way overpaid her. And I was like, please go. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, I felt so bad. Um, so I hired wrong man, but um, Shauna came on, who's actually Brandon's stepmom, And she's now my director of operations. She came on as an agent and um, quickly just saw those, those S and C qualities in her on the disc assessment. And I was like, I need you to help me run this thing. So pivoted her, pivoted her to a operations role. And that's when we started to get better systems and processes. Cause I can attract people. I can attract business. I can attract clients, um, agents, but then it's like, what do we do with all of them? So once I put her in that role, we started to look more like a company and not just me willy nilly and around. And, um, that year had a lot of highs and lows, but we did like 30 million and we were like, okay, cool. We're on to something. Yep. Yep. Love it, dude. So yeah. And I, I love that you brought up the mistake of, of not hiring the admin first. Dude. Cause I mean, it's, it's, and I get why agents think that, Oh, I got an abundance of leads. I'll just have agents work these, but I've never met an agent. Now, luckily I hired an admin first and, and it was on accident. I didn't do it intentionally, but, um, I mean, I did, but I didn't. It wasn't like I knew to hire an admin first for agents. I just, I just was looking for that help first. I didn't even think about hiring an agent, you know, right? Um, at that time. But everybody that I know that's done, I know a lot, dude. Um, have all lived to regret it. Oh man, right? it was it was painful, and I wasted a lot of money. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that if, I mean, if if you're an agent listening to this, find that great support piece before you start trying to get more bandwidth on on buyers agents. Yeah. Yep. No, I couldn't agree more, man. Yeah. Cause like, as you said, and it, it happens every time like clockwork, man, if, if you don't hire that assistant, you become it. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And I'm not good at that role. So not only am I now the assistant, but I also suck at it. So yeah. like, that's a double whammy of not good. You know what I mean? Yep. All right. So then you're, you're, um, um, down the system, down the operations. Um, I mean, what, what size were your team in that into that third year at 30 million, I, mean, I, think we yeah. had, I think we had, uh, it was me, Shauna, Brian Grayson. Um, I think I had like four or five agents. So, okay. but I was doing, you know, 15 million of the production and everyone was new. I, I think I did 16 solo that year. 
Yeah. And then the, the other four did like 14 million. They were all, you know, I had one at like 4 million, 3 million. So I wasn't giving them, well, they were new, but I needed to give them better opportunities to do more business. Yeah. But I think it's important too, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, at least in your experience, but like one mistake I see for a lot of team leaders um, is they allocate too much time to their agents up front. And, 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 and what I mean by that is because in the beginning you, you hit a threshold it takes some time to hit a threshold where the revenue coming in for the agents um, can cover your overhead. Plus at some point, like if you're going to stop production and give them all your time, you got to also have a salary associated to that. And I see so many real team leaders do they're, they're, they're given 80% of their time to their agents training, whatever they stop their own production and it just crushes their business. And it's kind of that, that time allocation where it's, it becomes a delicate dance, delicate, you know, like right now you're probably at the point where you don't even need to produce yeah, right. But there is that delicate dance. Well, you know, I mean, it, and that's been something and quite frankly, man, I'm still in the dance a little bit, right? Because as we've grown, you know, I'm at, you know, we'll probably be at 20 agents on the team by month's end and um, giving them, I don't need to be in production anymore, but quite frankly, my P&L is so much more beautiful when I go sell a few homes. <laughs> Cause it's like hundred percent revenue. So this year I've still sold, I think I've sold like 30 homes this year already. Um, but I've leveraged it out. Right. I don't show, I don't write, I don't, I can't even write a contract anymore, quite frankly. But when I can do hundred percent deals, it keeps me profitable. And I think that's where a lot of team leads get in trouble is they try to get out of production too soon. And like right now, man, I'm I'll grind. Like I don't mind the work. So it's like, if I need to go do 50, 60 deals solo to make sure that I have the revenue to let this company grow appropriately, then I'm going to do that. Um, but do I want to be out of production? Yeah. It'd be, or can I just focus on my investment side more, which I'm sure we're going to touch on? Yes, that would be great. But right now, man, if I can still sell two, three homes a month on my own and granted it's leveraged, I'm not out showing these homes. I'm not writing the contracts, but that's hundred percent revenue to my P and L it's big. But when I take away from that and then I'm all just coaching, man, the P&L gets beat up. I'm like, damn, like, you know, after splits and everything, there's a lot of revenue gone. So um, I'm still in that dance, man. I'm still, I'm still learning every day. Yep. Yep. For sure, man. So then, but you got, you got your agents now yeah, doing the 120 and as you keep adding, right? Like you, you just, there, there becomes that, that company dollar that comes in where it keeps adding. It makes sense to, to, to transition out. But like you said, man, so many, and I get it. I think I'm sure you have that feeling. I know I was there. We're like, dude, the last thing I want to do is, is work with another friend client. Like you want to get out so bad, you know, but you right. got to take the time and, and, and be fiscally responsible with it. Um, what, uh, um, cause dude, you guys are recruiting fast. Like, what do you, like recruiting can be tough, dude. And a lot of, I mean, I see so many team leaders and broker owners struggle with it. Like, what are you doing to attract these people to recruit these people? I mean, are you intentionally doing it or are you still just cause your personality, your charisma, people coming to you? So I just share my life, you know, I just, I share my life on, on social, which I, I think I probably, <clears throat> I don't run like a, a, I'm not the typical realtor business page, right? Like I just share my life. I share my beautiful wife, my kids, uh, the, uh, you know, I'm walking a flip. I, I share the math on, you know, how you do this. Oh, I acquire this. So I think people just get naturally attracted to that. And I get a lot of messages, man, where people are like, Hey, can I have some guidance? Can I have some help? Can I have an opportunity? And if they're the right people, I just say, great, man, let's figure out a way to make this work. Um, so I think it's just still me naturally attracting. I mean, I've, I run a few promotions on Instagram and on Facebook here and there, which has brought me like two agents. But the majority of my agents come from the industry and then also having a good reputation in the industry, treating people well. So vendors, title partners, lenders, when they have an agent who's looking for something, a lot of them say, hey, you should go talk to Temp, you know, because yeah. he's got a good vibe going on. And if it's a good fit, great. I'll bring you on. And if it's not, I'll try to recommend you to someone I think you're going to work better with. Yep. Well, it, so now, you know, three years into, you know, uh, uh, you're running a team now, five years in your business, but three years essentially running a team. You talked about the mistake with the assistant and whatever. Um, you know, knowing what you know now, like what, what advice would you give to somebody that's looking to grow their team or scale their team? Like, like, cause it's easy to talk about all the successes, you know, right. But like, what, what were some like those, shit man maybe like almost devastating uh, uh mistakes that you made you know the, the, those failures learning curves whatever you want to call them that you know that you fixed now but you would give anybody that's in that position that that you start at three years ago that you'd be like dude don't do these things 
I would say lock yourself in a room for a week and hire a consultant. Do whatever you have to do. I don't know what that is. Pay some money, do something, but make sure you have systems and processes in place sooner, right? Because I've been building all this on the run and I just wish so badly in the beginning, I would have just taken a quick break and laid a really beautiful foundation to build this house on. But I didn't do it that way, right? So now I'm having to almost stop production at times, fix things, get them very sturdy and sound, and then build on top of them. So I would get an amazing foundation and clarity on what you want sooner. That clarity is huge, man. So I teach on this and I do temp talks and different things. If you don't have clarity of what you actually want out of life, then you know, you see these huge producers on stage. And I remember when I started, I was like, I want that. And then you realize, wow, they're not happy or they're not living a life that would fulfill me. Why am I trying to build what they've built? Right. So get clarity on like your life plan and then build something around that rather than just like go sell more homes, go sell more homes. Well, what does that actually mean for you? Like, and your family. So I was not clear on what I wanted soon enough and I didn't stop and build systems and processes on the front end that I can now grow something massive on. Like we spoke about before, you're putting processes in place for a massive business, right? That can grow and you're thinking bigger sooner. So that's what I would do. Think bigger sooner, get clarity and have systems and processes that are already build the 10 lane highway before, you know, build the 10 lane freeway, even when you only need the two lane highway, because now when those cars are humming or those agents, you have the capacity to service it. Yeah. Love it. Couldn't agree more, dude. And then, um, so when you, you talked about those buckets for, for your sources, sphere of influence, open houses and Zillow, um, is, is those still look similar today as far as your residential business, not the flipping business, but, um, mm-hmm. or is that transitioned? It's transitioned, man. It's, it's a great platform when you're solo and you can really control the lead. But if you're going to scale, it's too expensive to feed 17 agents on Zillow. It's just, it's not possible. Um, so we still spend a little bit with them, right? Like um, we've, we, but we've gradually gone down. I mean, at one point I was spending $8,000 a month with them and then I went to five and you know, we're transitioning out of that. Now we're mostly Google pay per click and Facebook ads. Yeah. Um, and my cost per lead went from 120 a lead to now I'm at like $13. My average, my average Google pay per click lead and my average Facebook lead, you know, I could get that down to 50 cents, you know, depending on what ad I run. Yep. Um, um, a lot of the Facebook stuff I learned through you, through your platform. Yeah. Yeah. I know. We, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's not as instantaneous as like a realtor.com or Zillow. I look at realtor.com and Zillow is like the modern day sign goal. It's kind of replaced the sign goal. Right? Really, um, yeah, you know, like the Zillow for me, it was more people willing to like go look at a house and write an offer. Yeah. My Facebook ads don't really do that. But if you have a good incubation system and a good follow-up system, I mean, there's, there is gold in there. Yeah. Um, and then just getting your agents to buy in and believe that these leads are as powerful as they are is the other half of the battle. Yeah, no, I agree, dude. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's, you know, instead of the Zillow or Realtor.com being instantaneous, right? Like it seems like Facebook or six, seven months. But if you go through that nurture process, I, I've never seen a better return on marketing. Like we're at a 21x gross return on Facebook. It's freaking stupid. No, it, it's right? crazy. And then, and then also like just running like sub ads for my brand. So like anybody in my database, I run like a Christmas campaign to them. We're only there seeing, we're, I'm just doing branding things for pennies on the dollar. You know what I mean? So there's just so many cool things inside Facebook that you can do for not only uh, lead generation, but also just like brand awareness. You guys still attacking uh, open houses? We are. So what's tough though, in this market, as you know, our inventory is selling super quick. So it's like, and we'll, we, you know, we have this really great listing that we want to hold open. Then we sell it in the first day or two, which we'll still hold it open. But once it's UCB on, on MLS, it's, just a little bit slower traffic. Yep. Yep. Love it, dude. So then, um, I mean, so <laughs> this in transition and pivot, I'm, I'm curious how, and you know, I get as a realtor, you, 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 you're exposed to, to so many deals and, 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 and whatnot out there, but how the whole flipping and wholesaling start? Okay. So I had this little duplex. Um, I, a good, one of my best friends, his name's Kevin Turner. Um, he's from New Mexico. He moved out here. He was at the office I was at at that time and he was doing what I had no idea at the time was off market business. And I'm like, what the hell is that? Like what's off market business? Um, 
And I didn't realize I was doing it the whole time. I was bird dogging for investors. You know, I was really good at finding deals on MLS. I sent it to this guy who made it, he made it seem like he was doing some science project when really all he was doing, it was moving it to an end buyer. And I was like, I can do that. So anyway, I had this duplex and my buddy told me what it was. And he goes, man, why are you going to put your sign in the yard for an $80,000 duplex in like in the hood? He goes, contract that and, you know, let's try to sell it. So I, you know, as a licensed agent, you really got to disclose. So I said, Hey man, how much do you want for this property? I can list it for you or I can, um, or I can just be the buyer. And he goes, dude, I need 80,000 cash. If you got me that you're good. And I'm like, all right, I'll give you the 80 cash. Um, but I'm going to try to make a profit. I'm either going to sell this contract or flip it. Are you okay with that? And he's like, yeah, man, if I get the 80 in the next seven days, I'm good. So I contracted it and then I sold it at a hundred thousand to an end buyer, someone who wanted the cash flow. So what would have been like a $2,000 commission ended up being $20,000 in revenue. That doing that once will get you motivated. I was like, what? Yeah. Like, so I took off my realtor hat and honestly, most of the time now I'm wearing my investor hat instead of my realtor hat. Um, you know, I'm so blessed to have Sean and my director of operations who really makes T group kind of click. That's my traditional side. And I just go hunt for deals all day, every day, and then coach and motivate my agents. So anyway, man, as soon as I found out how much revenue was on the off market side, I was hooked. So that was my first deal. And then I just like, I'm a spun, I'm a huge reader. You know, I didn't get to finish college. So if I'm in the car, I call that the university of Templeton. There's a book or a podcast on, and I just read every book I could on wholesaling, every book on flipping. And, um, I just dove in. If, if I do one thing well, I, I take risk and I jump in quick and I've been burned a couple times, but more often than not, I've, I've come out the other end um, in a better place or even, or learning something. Yeah. Love it. So those, like the 30 deals you've done year to date, cause it's, it's July, right? So let's just say you end up doing, you know, 50, 60 deals year to date. Um, are those, uh, are, are those attached to flips that you're doing that you're selling? Are those, straight other client deals so the 30 deals i've done i think i've done 28 traditional deals this year through my sphere of influence so the, i don't take leads anymore the only thing i do is work my database so if one of my friends or family or past clients calls great i'm going to take care of you personally um that means i'm going to negotiate the contract and do yeah. all that but really my tc takes on the escrow she writes the contract um and my, my agent is typically going to go show the home so I'm, that's my deal, but I'm not doing, it's not super cumbersome on my time. So those 20, 28 deals are traditional. And then I usually wholesale three to five deals a month where I just, I call it like my little war chair. I got this big ass leather chair and I just go find deals. And then I've learned how to contract them. And then I have a very big pool of investors that buy from me. And th there's two things that make a great off market deal. It's the deal and money. Those are the two things you need. In the beginning, I had no money. So I had to get good at finding the deal. Um, so now that's what I do, man. I'm just a master. I wouldn't say I'm a master, but I am good at finding deals and then partnering with the right people that, that want to hold them as a flip or an end buyer. Yep. Love it, dude. So then, um, cause I get asked this question quite a bit, um, uh, more so like in, in the boot camp and stuff that I do or, or, or my, you know, from coaching clients, but it's, um, like, where do you go find the buyers? You know, right? Because you have these great relationships with with investors. I'm sure it's it's not like a different one for each five, you know, each, each closing, right? You might have a handful that you're constantly feeding, and it creates this great relationship. And 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 I think a lot of real estate is like that's the, the the dream, right? Um, you know, and I know there's of course meetup groups, and you can go down the courthouse and meet them. And you're like, what suggestion would you have? If somebody's like, dude, like. I can, I can find the deal, but I need that person with the money. How would you recommend that they go find an investor? I think the fastest way is to find a deal because great deals find money. So if you find a fat deal and you locked it up at the right place and you put it on your Facebook or you put it on Craigslist and it's true, that's truly the numbers you have it at off that first deal, you'll probably get 20 investor calls that you need to then start creating a database. Um, for me, I actually plugged in with a, a great friend of mine now his name is Jamil he runs Keegley he's a huge wholesaler he does 30 40 deals a month in the beginning I didn't even have the investors so what I did is I said okay if I can find the deal will you help me sell it and I'll split the money with you so I didn't even have the investor yet but I found somebody who had the investors right so you just have to get creative on like 
um, bringing value to the people who can help you. Yeah. So he had, he has the biggest buyers list here in Arizona or one of, so he could sell my deal in a day when maybe I lock something up and I could have never got it sold. Well, now I'm like, Hey man, take half the revenue and I'd rather make five grand instead of 10 or instead of nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would say that piece is go find deals because investors will call you and find you and post them. And then also um, go to your network again, friends and family. I mean, I have my last house that I bought everybody. So now the same way I share that I'm a realtor, I also share that I'm an investor and I can show people better returns than the traditional market can. And if they're ever interested in that, I'd love to help them. So when me and my wife, I, I share that with everybody. It's like, Hey, if you have extra capital that you want to put into deals, let's, I can show you what that structure looks like and I can get you paid. So we bought a house in Gilbert like last year. And then we decided like, we're all minimalist right now and we're, we've downsized and I'm in this like crazy headspace on that. We could go into that, but um, we sold the big house with the, all that. But the people I bought it from, they, we connected super well and they have their, they have money. So I was like, Hey guys, if you're ever looking for something, this is what I do. I'd love to connect. I mean, I just bought their house. I don't know them. Now they're my biggest investor. They've opened up a million dollars to me that I can use at my discretion to go show us a return. Yeah. So it's just, it's really just figuring out. It's just sharing what you're doing, sharing what you're doing with passion and being authentic, being genuine, because people can see through the BS. If I was trying to pitch that and I had never done it, they could tell, right? But I got confidence, I got educated, and I said, hey man, I feel confident that I could show a return on your money, and now I have a million dollars of theirs that I go use every day. Yeah. Well, and this is where I think, um, you know, things like you're talking about of, of sharing so publicly on, on Facebook is an example of, because we don't always know, but that person, you, you bought the house from, you pitch, you know, you tell them that you can help them, right? They go on Google, they start Googling you, Right. Um, and if you have a Facebook, yeah, account, right, everybody's going to see it. They're going to be able to see like, well, shit, dude, this guy's legit, man. He's, he's out there doing this four or five times a month, you know, right. So they allow them to do their due diligence and lock it up. Exactly. And Hey, I'm plugging in my computer real quick, just cause it's at 6%. I don't want That's it to die. Sorry, Josh. One sec. Yeah. You're good, dude. The lighting's not so great over here, but at least you still got me. Yep. So, um, but yeah, man, it's just, they can look you up. And then if you really are doing something, people, people can, they have a BS meter, right? So if you're bullshit and they'll know, but if you, if you're just being, don't ever lie to people, don't tell them that you're a master of something that you're not. But if you're confident in your ability to do something, ask people for the business, man, because they're looking for other ways to generate income, especially people with money, man. They're looking... Those guys out there love it. They're leveraging my time and my skill and getting a great return on their money. You know what I mean? So it's a win-win. Yep. Yep. Love it. Now, do you find yourself ever getting more torn? Like, like, cause you got, you got, you know, that business that you could blow up. And if you just focus on that business, you got the real estate team that's blowing up that you could, you know, and, and I don't live in this whole world of either or, you know, there's no reason that you can't do all of it. Um, but do you ever find yourself being more attracted or more pulled towards one over the other? Yeah. I mean, when I first started wholesaling, I almost was like going to shut down my biz. I was like, dude, I'm just going to do off market. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing? Temp? Right. Because it almost becomes like intoxicating where you're like, holy shit, this is awesome. But I've learned that my real estate team is the engine that all of this other good stuff spins off of. So to your point though, I feel like I've been dabbling in it and I've been interested instead of becoming a master of it. So literally yesterday I reached out to someone that I highly respect in that field and hired him as a coach. So like for me, T group is going to run and keep growing and be successful. And now I want to start my cash offer business and my investment business to run parallel with it and grow. Um, but for me, I had to find a mentor and a coach. So I just, I literally just hired him yesterday, which that's kind of something people should realize is like, I'm pretty dang good at this. People come to me now for mentorship and guidance. And I'm still seeking coaching on it, right? Because I understand that I don't know enough. So I want to get better at it so I can grow quicker. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you break it down, like you're more successful right now than you've ever been in your life, right? But you're probably also investing more in coaches than you've ever invested in your life. Like I know I am. Yeah, right? Dude, I, I spend like some people's salary on just coaching. Yep. And um, 
but the ROI is infinite, man. Like you find the right coach. You know, I coach with Bill Hart. He has given me so much clarity and that's a thousand dollars an hour. And that thousand dollars has brought me more return this year than some of my other things. You know what I mean? So, and when you're the team lead, you have no one to answer to, you know, I have to answer to my God and my wife, <laughs> yeah. but it's nice to have a coach that I'm accountable to. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Love it, man. So you brought it up and I can't help but, but not ask you, but you talked about the, the whole minimalist, which, which I love, man. I mean, I, I, uh, I had a mentor of mine years ago, looks at me, he goes, you know the difference between me and you, Josh? I'm like, no, what? And he goes, I'm actually truly rich. And you're just trying to, to uh, 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 convince the world that you're rich, you know? Right. And I, and, and I look at him, I'm like, fuck, it was like a dagger, but I'm like, you're right. probably like, stung a little bit, you know, right? right? Um, and he's like, dude, and this guy, you know, this dude's bringing in 60 mil a, 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 a month that he makes, you know, right? Um, and uh, um, or I'm sorry, on a yearly basis, but the dude's a player, right? I mean, broke down like $36,000 an hour, like the dude's a, uh, legit. And he's like, here, here's what you got to do. He goes, yeah, I live this lifestyle now. He goes, but I, I learned to operate off of 10% of my income. <clears throat> and, it, you know, paid, of course, Uncle Sam theirs, but then everything else invested. He's like, learn to, to dial below your means. And we had downsides heavily. And now we're at 5% of our, our income. Yeah, right. Um, like, dude, I'll make more in a month than my house costs, right? Uh, um, but it allows you to go out through those other things. And, and you know, is that, is that somewhat of what led to the pivot of you doing this? So you can go out and create true wealth or what's led to this? So, yes, I love personal finance. Um, and I, I think every, every person has to go through it in their own rate. But, like, in year three or year four, when I started making kind of real money, we went and bought a silly house with, like, my hot tub had flames and it was 12, per, you know, like all this stuff. And, like, 10 months in, my wife and I look at each other and we're like, Are, is this what we want? Like, this place is huge. I know you hate cleaning it. I hate paying for it. And we can afford it very, very easily, even the big house that we were in. But we were like, you know what? Let's start playing this game differently. Um, and I read this this book called Goodbye Things by this Japanese author that I can't pronounce his name, but it's called Goodbye Things. And literally, Josh, that night, I went and got rid of 80% of my closet. I had about 200 pairs of sneakers. That got cut down to about 40, which there's some I just can't get rid of. Um, and I started to create a life plan to get rid of the excess. I, I said, you know what, man? I don't give a shit what anyone thinks you know, let them think we're in financial hardship or let them think we're in whatever because we're downsizing and I sold my big 750 LI and I got, I just wanted so much extra income. So you know what I've been able to do this year though now, Josh, is I've bought six homes this year for buy and hold. I've bought a home a month that I've put into my portfolio. Yeah. That's not possible if my expenses are just through the roof, right? There's just not enough. I'm playing, you know, so now if I can even stay on this track of, Let's just call it half. Let's say I'm done buying homes this year, which is probably not the case, but I can just buy six homes a year for the next four years. I mean, how much passive revenue do I have? And, you know, and I believe there's good debt and bad debt. And good debt is debt that's in your name that someone else pays for. And bad debt is something that has to come out of your pocket. So I've become massively intentional on only having good debt and then keeping my expenses low. So I earn, I earn great income and my wife and I live on about, seven to eight grand a month right now. Yeah. I mean, we bought a $330,000 house. We did the, we did the bathrooms and I helped my folks get a place and I opened an office one street down. Like I can walk to work, man. I just reconfigured my life and said, I don't need it all. Right. Like my house payment now, dude, is 1400 bucks. Like, and where I was, was like six G's a month. Yeah. So anyway, like for me, it just, I have so much clarity. And when you get rid of the things, it brings so much power into you because I'm just focused on what's important. And that's the, the people, the moments and the legacy that I'm going to leave on my, especially my three kids. My, I have three little boys. I'm focused on that. I don't care uh, if I have three fat whips in the car and, and the flames are on, on the hot tub. Like I really just don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. Do you think, you know, cause sometimes I think about this where, you know, um, you know, it's, it's like, all right, because you and I, we can talk about this, you know, like, like having the fancy, like all the, who gives a shit about the fancy watch, the fancy cars, the fancy, you know, whatever. But it's like, we also had them and realized 
You, know, you like, had to have them to realize you know, that it's like, oh, dude, this ten thousand dollar watch doesn't really make me feel like it, it becomes fucking silliness, you know, right? Or the the you know one hundred twenty thousand dollar car or whatever. It's like like I drive my pickup truck, my Tundra. I like more than my freaking Jag XF, you know, right? That I had and but do you feel like you had to experience that to come and get the clarity that you have now? Where you're like, well, fuck, I don't really, you know, because you've ex- you've had them and you realize they add no value to your life. I did. I had to experience it because. Dude, I used to, I'm big on affirmations and visualization, essentially the savers that Hal Elrod does. Um, I mean, I'm all in on those. And um, I would visualize my Hyundai Sonata was that 750 Li, dude. I was like, that's what I, I was in that car. You know, I could feel the leather. I could feel the, the, the Harman Kardon sound system. I could feel it, right? I would visualize that wherever I was driving. And then I got it. And literally within two weeks, I was like, this changes my life zero yeah. percent. You know, I'm impressing people at streetlights who don't give a shit. You know what I mean? Who are never going to know me that have no, um, they have no interest in my life and my well being. Why do I care what they're thinking? So I do think I had to do it though, to then learn. I tell my agents now, I'm like, you guys do not buy that car. Like it will not change your life. No one cares. No one cares. They still buy the car. Yeah. And then they buy it and then they're like, damn it. I shouldn't have bought the car. Like, I think you all, we all have to feel it. Cause I had people tell me like, yo, you don't need to do that. And then I had to learn through my own experience. Yeah. Love it, dude, man. Um, so do you, like, what, what do you, you know, it's kind of a hard question. You, you know, you got so much growth going on. There's, I mean, so many great things going on and it's, you know, but do you, like, what do you see all this going? Like, do you, I mean, do you have like a, a, a vision that you have? Cause like, dude, like you are, I mean, obviously you're very intelligent, right? You're very freaking driven as hell. You're, you've got a, you know, awesome personality. You can tell that you're, you're kind of that servant leader, if you will. Like, I mean, just sitting here talking, I, I can see like be mad, like one of these guys on stages, coaching, firing people up. Like, I mean, do you, do you where do you see all this to take in you? Well, it's, and thank you for the kind words, but I would just say, man, like, it's funny that you just mentioned that I have found that my biggest passion right now is when I'm uh, motivating, inspiring and helping people. Um, gosh, it, it lights me up. Like I do these things called temp talks and I did one yesterday and I, I spoke to people about, you know, um, your thoughts, the power of your thoughts, getting clarity on your vision and then, um, living a life of standards, discipline and consistency. That's kind of one thing that I've kind of created and I'll teach on that. So, I want to, I would love it, man, if in the next three to five years, I was filling auditoriums of people that I could genuinely change their life and help them. Um, That would, my heart, like I could go to the grave knowing that like, man, I made an impact. I don't want it to be, man, that guy made a bunch of money. He sold a bunch of houses. Like who gives a shit? I want to help people. So that's first and foremost. And then I also like, I have, I have segregated lanes that I'm really focused on. So that's the business piece, right? Like that's my legacy that I want to cultivate for myself. But then, you know, what do I want my financial life to look like? So I have very clear goals on what I want that to be. You know, I would love $25,000 of passive income a month because at that point coming from assets that I can hold long-term that are tangible um, because if you can't live well on 25 G's a month, I mean, I'm all for like, Hey, go do what you got to do, make more income. And that's great. But if you can't live well on 25 G's a month, you're an asshole. Yeah. So it's like, that's kind of my freedom number where at that point I'm working because I'm passionate and I'm choosing to, and not because I have to. Um, and then I also have very clear clarity. I coach all my boys, soccer teams. You know, I spend a lot of time with them and I've gotten really good at saying no. Like if it's not in alignment with, with my kids and my wife, um, it's just probably not going to happen. So hopefully that kind of answers it. But man, I I would really love to speak, motivate and inspire people at a high level. Yep. Not like what's going to happen. Right. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you're doing it right now on the podcast, right? And you're you're already doing it, but the the success you're creating, dude, it's just, it's just going to continue to happen more and more and more, dude. And you have people begging you to, to come speak and, and, and that's dope, dude. So, um, 
Um, I know we're getting long on time, um, but you know, I'm really curious, dude, with all this going on, you talked about you gotten so good at saying no, which is so important, man. I mean, so many people waste so much freaking time on just bullshit that doesn't matter. Can you walk us through like, I mean, do you have like a, a, a daily planning session that you go through or, or reflection time, like you're just in solitude where you can create that intention and make sure that you stay that focused? Because with all this you got going on, I'm sure you're pulled in a thousand different directions every day. I am, man. And I was getting overwhelmed by it. So I've really, um, I have found the power of meditation and I'm not great at it, but I just use an app called Headspace. Um, and I do these guided meditations sometimes three times a day, you know, but I at least usually hit it once a day. My poor wife, man, she has to hear, the, she has to hear me medicine. Like she has to hear this. Like it's like an Australian accent talking to me, guiding me through this meditation. But, um, that has been huge for me to get clarity. Um, and then also I just have to like, to your point about saying no, dude, I'm kind of bring me back on the question. Cause I, I got, a, I'm like ADHD. I got, I got on a different train of thought. Yeah, no. So it was, uh, um, you know, how, how do you stay focused? How, how do you, how do you intentionally know what to say yes to no to when oh, you, okay. you directions? and do you have a, like a daily planning reflection session that you go through to do it? My bad. Thanks for bringing that back. Okay. So. I meditate to get clear. And then I also use a planner, um, a mentor and friend of mine named Todd Bookspan. Uh, he's a great lender here in the state. He has developed a planner called win by noon. And um, it's just, it's, it's super simple, but it's just laid out to where I can write the three things I'm grateful for my top three things I need to do that day. Um, it has an actual calendar laid out. So I take my, every morning I take my, um, I take my phone calendar and then literally write it in there. And then it has a place for notes and then a to-do list. And then, you know, did you win your morning? Did you exercise? Did you do those things? So now I actually have a physical template that I can go back and see what Q3 looked like or Q2 looked like or Q1 looked like. And it, it's great. So I love that piece. Um, and then one thing that you said, like when we break from our team meetings, I always ask everyone to set an intention on the day. So like we'll go in the circle and I'll be like, hey, what, what's the one thing you need to do today to make today successful? When I got serious about setting intention and rather than just like working to work, um, that's been a game changer. So I follow a planner. Um, I hit my, my morning routine is that that has to happen. I pretty much just follow the savers from Hal Elrod. And then I have, I've set a new, and then I've set standards in my life. Like a lot of people want to meet with me now. And this is going to sound not the greatest to say, but if I feel like I'm reaching up, I will go to you. I will take the time to get in the car and go to you and spend Like if you said you wanted me in your um, office today to do this, I'm driving, right? I'm going to be there. But if it's a newer agent or someone that is, is asking for my time, they have to come to me. They got to come to my office and I'll, I'll take 15, 20, 30 minutes and meet with you. But man, I was driving to all these meetings that didn't really matter. And I was wasting three, four hours a day and I was making them productive because I'm listening to books and podcasts. But man, I was killing my day by doing that. So I've had to set some standards around the way I operate and who I operate with. And I'm happy to be with anybody, but you got to come to me. Yeah. Love it, dude. Love it, man. So um, those that are watching and listening, dude, if they want to follow you on social media, see what you're doing, which I highly, highly suggest that they all do. If they want to see the, the Tim talks that you have going on, like, what was the best place to do that, dude? And just to continue following you. If you just want to follow my life and my business, I would say uh, my Instagram handle, The Templeton Group. And Templeton is T-E-M-P-L-E-T-O-N. So The Templeton Group. Um, I mean, if you follow my stories, I kind of share my life all day. I was sharing before this. I was talking about I was going to be on your podcast. And after this, I'll probably talk about how the podcast went. Um, you know, I just kind of share. It's almost like a mini vlog on there. Um, and then also Templeton Walker uh, on Facebook. It's a public profile. I share a ton of stuff on there. I literally just got a client who's an NFL player. Um, he found me on Facebook. I was like pop and lock into a Usher video. <laughs> like just doing a goofball. And he was like, dude, I wanted to hire you as soon as I knew you, you, you could groove. I was like, all right, cool. So, I mean, I just, you know, I'm just myself. Um, so Facebook, Instagram, and then, you know, my email's Templeton at T group And I mean, I don't, dude, you have a big following. I don't know if I should put the cell out there. <laughs> <laughs> right on those watching us. We'll have all those links below so you can see those and, and, and uh, connect with, with temp right away. So, um, 
you know, man, those that are watching and listening, dude, are, are, are here for a reason, right? They want to go out there and create an amazing epic life like you've been able to do for yourself, man. And I know that um, you we're talking off air, like you, you didn't have the typical upbringing. You didn't know all the right people, didn't go to all the right schools. You didn't, you know, like have the right education growing up. You didn't, you know, right? Like if, if you were to look at it from a societal standpoint, it's like the cards weren't stacked for you to go out right. there freaking crush it to the way that that you are and you know you and i like half our bodies covered in freaking tattoos and you know it, it's kind of the opposite of what you typically see out there but with that being said man I mean, you went out there and 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 have, uh, can, have crushed it and continue to crush it and those watching listen dude they're they're here because they want to do the same thing um do you have any last words of inspiration or advice that you'd like to leave them with so they can do exactly that um man i would just say think bigger sooner and we spoke about that off off air but do not put limitations on yourself and especially don't let any other people out in the world put lim limitations on you because when you get serious about your own self-development and your vision and you have clarity on what, on why you're building something, man, the sky's the limit. So I would just say, think bigger sooner um, and get serious about share. If you're a realtor or if you're a business person, you need to encompass that at all times. If you're getting a haircut, Make sure that that dude knows that you're a realtor and you'd like to help them. If you're buying groceries, make sure that cashier knows that you're a realtor and you'd like to help her. If you're, you got a flat tire and the, the, the AAA guy comes, make sure he knows you're a realtor and you'd like to help him, especially in the beginning, right? Like I don't do that as much anymore because I couldn't even service those clients. I mean, I still do and I would pass them to my agents, but if you're new and you're trying to get on your grind, man, you got to be loud and some people are going to hate on you. Fuck them. Dude, you got to be loud and just wear that shit with pride and be like, you know what? I love what I'm doing. I'm excited about it. I'm coming from a place of service. Who can I help? If you do that, man, I get chills right now thinking about it. You can do anything. So that's, that's my advice. Love it, dude. So that's such powerful stuff. And those that are watching and listening, I know enter every podcast with this, but information without implementation truly is the start of delusion. Information is the power. It's taking that information, taking action on it. That allows you to go out there and create the power you need to create the life you know you want and deserve. And Tipple then shared so many amazing damn piece of advice with you guys. They take something that you want to take immediate action on it. So again, you go out there and create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Tim, dude, uh, um, man, I truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to be here, dude. This has been a huge honor, a hell of a lot of fun, dude. And uh, I know you're a busy man, dude. So this has been, you know, this has been awesome. I truly appreciate you. Man, thank you for having me. I woke up bright and early on this one. I was like, man, I'm, I'm on Josh's podcast. Let's go. Yep. Uh, well, we're going to do it again, man. I, I can't wait to have you on a second time, brother. So I truly appreciate it. And you guys watching, listening, thanks again. Thanks, bro. Hope you enjoyed this GSD Mode podcast episode. Now make sure you get shit done and smash that subscribe button now.